Hey, it's Jerry with TradeTheFifth.com. Going to go through the uh, index talk here that we've been doing over the last few weeks. I'm going to start out with the SPY. Um, I'm going to show, let's see, the monthly. You know, we got a bit of a doji forming on the monthly, which is looking a little bit questionable. Uh, we definitely had a strong week leading up until Friday. And we had a pretty significant sell-off and closed on the low of the week on increasing volume. So that's looking a bit bearish. And of course, on the daily, we had a pretty good you know, breakout. We talked about this little box here last week, this three-day consolidation range or four-day range that we're in. And we were talking about if we get above it, uh, the, the bias is going to be towards the upside. We certainly did get a breakout, which uh, looked pretty good on Thursday, and then had a significant reversal and failure in a big red candle on Friday, uh, which typically when you're closing on the low on uh, volume like this, it's uh, often an auction that's not finished yet. And uh, we could likely see some, some more selling into Monday would be my guess. Looking at the activity and the way things uh, have been turning out here, uh, based on really poor numbers in Europe. Uh, the German uh, Bund yield on the 10-year German Bund uh, has gone negative. You know, not really a good thing to have a negative yield on a treasury. And uh, we'll talk a minute, in a few minutes, we'll talk about the, uh, the three-month 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury rate inversion that occurred, which also probably triggered some algorithmic selling um, coupled with the really poor economic data in Europe. I think the manufacturing sector contracted. Its uh, PMI number was below 50, which is a contraction and manufacturing activity, and that's really never a good sign as Europe looks like it might be headed towards recession. Of course, they're trying more stimulus events, as is China, and probably the only thing that's going to save us at this point uh, from from what might be a much stronger sell-off is if they get some China-U.S. trade news, um, you know, maybe that could hold things in place. I'm not yet ready to throw in the towel and, and go all bare on everybody, but um, certainly the action on Friday and the volume um, wasn't great for the bulls. So um, that's the spy. I'm going to look at the cues. Oh, I will point out. Um, the RSI now with this, you know, higher high versus this period is showing negative divergence, right? So that's also a sign for um, maybe some downward activity. And if you look at the last time that we had a negative divergence back in this area, this higher high or this lower high in the RSI that was negative to the two highs, higher highs in the S SPY, let off, you know, kicked off a pretty big selling event, at least down in this period, right? So this negative divergence that's showing up in the weekly and uh, showing up here now in the daily in the oversold, uh, overbought zone, as well as the MACD we've been talking about for the last uh, two or three weeks showing negative divergence is really starting to indicate um, some, you know, significant slowing and upward momentum. You also couple that with we're coming to the end of a quarter and it's not uncommon, you know, where um, fund managers, a lot of them, you know, have bonuses based on performance and it's not a bad time to be booking profits so that your, uh, your bonus checks, if you're going to get them, are going to be nice and healthy. So Friday's activity may be a signal of more things to come. Um, I would also say in the SPY, we did close below the 21 exponential moving average, which is this line here. That's usually my, you know, want to take some profits on any longs that I have kind of activity, which which I uh, I did. Or I closed right just barely below it. So that's sort of the first sign of, of maybe, uh, you know, with the slowing momentum that we want to be taking some money off the table. At least I did. Um, I thought it was a good point. I had been taking, you know, we had this big up day here. I took some profits and some things. Just to me, it looked like things were getting uh, significantly overheated. I did not enter any additional long trades on this day. 
uh, but rather just took some profits and figured going into the weekend, um, I wanted to see how things were going to go. Of course, we also have this Mueller report that's coming out on uh, all this Russia investigation, so uh, we may start hearing some of that uh, information tomorrow, which is Sunday. This video is being recorded Friday night, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But I'm not going to be all out, um, you know, talking about a reversal and any significant bearish downside quite yet until I start seeing some closes underneath this uh, cloud. Uh, we typically see, if we move to the other side of the cloud and start closing below it, uh, often you'll see a, a push back to the cloud and then continued downside activity. So you're going to have some time if you want to uh, take some profits, uh, put on some hedges or other things. Um, I, you know, I don't think we're yet too late to be doing any of that kind of thing, especially as we start getting back into this box I've talked about before. We're really at the top of the box and you know if we're going to be heading down to the bottom area of this box or any period you know below uh, this indicating you know we do have a bit of reversal going on you're going to have a little bit of time uh, a little bit more time to be thinking about taking profits raising some cash and some other things given the big bullish run that we've had okay so let's look at the cues the cues have been significantly stronger um, they have reached a 1272 extension on this move that we've had in this area. Um, they did have a pretty big reversal back uh, down below that. They are the most extended. You know, the FANG stocks, Amazon's had a tremendous, uh, you know, up until Friday had a pretty big, uh, you know, maybe two week period. Apple's been moving pretty strong. Microsoft has been strong. So there's been a lot of things that have driven the cues uh, into what I look at as a parabolic move. And this was probably another signal when you see such a, a parabolic move and such an overbought reading um, in the RSI. If you look at the RSI over uh, this one year period I have in this chart, this is actually the highest reading it's had in, in well over a year. I'm going to have to go back quite some time to figure out an IS RSI reading uh, you know, in the mid 80s. Um, so all of those were probably significant um, measures of activity that was a little bit too heat, too hot. Um, on the weekly, we are still above the cloud on the weekly, although we did close near the lows. Um, this is a shooting star type pattern when you're closing on the lows. Um, now I did do some research. Uh, there's a pattern site um, called the pattern site.com and you you can look up a lot of uh, patterns right this is the Bulkowski's shooting star analysis and it talks about um, you know it is a bearish candle on the weekly for the cues it did close on the lower side of the candle and if you read some uh, information here you'll see that uh, you know, about 59% of the time, this candle uh, type pattern after an uptrend, um, you know, tends to move back down um, to some extent. And the best average move in 10 days is 3.86% in a bear market with an up breakout. And this, this pattern tends to be more reliable when you're in a downtrend and you get a reversal up. And then you see this pattern, you tend to get some more downward continuation. It, it, as you read the notes here, you know, he, he talks about it, uh, it. It works best when you're down in the lower third of the year in terms of price performance and that kind of thing. So I would say that there's not a high amount of reliability to say that we're into some significant bearish downside activity. However, given the SPY closed the way it did, um, and we did have a, you know, we did close on the lows of the day. I do think, you know, a pullback to the cloud area like we had in here is probably, um, in, in my opinion, more likely than not, given the, the size of the reversal that we had in the queues. So, in all the FANG stocks and other stuff that are heavily weighted in the, in the queues index, I think it's just something to be cautious about. I'm looking at the IWM here, which is the Russell. Um, I'm going to show 
a little uh, another chart here in a minute but you know we do have the channel that I've drawn you know back in 2015 or so I had this channel drawn we are pulling back below the center line of this channel the Russell definitely looks the weakest right it did not break like the Q's to a new high uh, or the spy it has been showing relative weakness more significantly than the other indexes and I have found that the Russell tends to lead the direction uh, one way or the other quite often and I'm going to show that here by another chart I'm going to pull in this is a comparison chart and this shows you last year this is the one year performance of a handful of things on a percentage axis and this yellow line is Apple this is all of 2018 right so this is January to December in 2018 we have the uh, Apple stock up plotted up here and you can see Apple had a pretty big reversal and closed down on the year um, the one I really want to focus in on is the financials which I think is the yeah XLF is this purple line that's one of them and the other one is Rus the Russell which is the red line red for Russell the IWM and you'll see here in this period I'm gonna zoom in on when the, the this is the S and uh, the spy and you can see the spy has you know in the earlier part of last year was going up but notice how the Russell was was starting to roll over and lead the way to the downside and, it, and it eventually the S&P started following uh, the Russell down so the Russell in this case led the price activity and what was going on in the S&P down to the February correction and pretty significant sell-off that we had in 2018 in February and you can also see the purple line is the financials they you know tended to have pretty significant uh, follow through to the downside along with the SPY and I'm gonna go out into I think it was September when we started having a similar set of activity now the SPY here uh, this is still September of last year um, let's see this is July and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and you can see again the SPY is still you know doing okay I wouldn't say it's going you know ball busters but it is hitting the new high right so we hit the all-time high of 293.94 in the SPY but you can see the Russell was flattening out and it started getting you know again leading the way to the downside and then inevitably the SPY followed it significantly and also in this case um, when the S&P was making a new high the XLF the financials ETF started making a much more significant downside move right so this went from 3% up to the year to actually down 1.3% and as this you know Russell started to go down everything started significantly following it uh, to the downside and of course we had a really significant sell-off right so now if I change the time scale to uh, look at the uh, let's see daily one year I'm gonna go a year to date now this is looking at this year 2019 so if you look at the same comparisons you can see the Russell actually let us out right so this orange line again is the Russell 2000 and it started to get a much more significant bullish move on the percentage price axis right so and the Russell peaked out around um, February 21st right and the Russell ever since then has been moving down its bounce was less significant than the S&P right and now we're starting to see another downward move in the Russell and this one is coincident with a big move down in the XLF right so the XLF financials were almost 12 percent to the upside and now it's down to five percent right so in just a week's time we have lost almost seven percent in the financial sector uh, Apple I think has been the thing that has been you know propping up in some of the 
Fang stocks. Uh, this is the XLK, the technology ETF. Um, sorry, the Russell was the red line, but uh, this was the Dow Jones transports. But roughly speaking, we still, you know, the peak um, of the Russell, sorry, was uh, the 1st of March. The transport started rolling over in February, which is another uh, indicator I look at as the transports. Um, you know, the rails, the airlines, and other things have been rolling over. But the Russell started moving over, moving down on the 1st of March, and it is now starting to make a much bigger downside move. Um, and this is the thing that's got me a little concerned, I think, going into the future and what's going to hold for next week, unless we get any other significant news that's going to help us um, you know, look better to the upside. Now the Russell is starting to enter, you know, towards an oversold zone. Um, the MACD has already rolled over and it's now negative. The three uh, period simple moving average is now below the 10. So it's, uh, you know, showing negative uh, momentum. And we do see, you know, we have now broken below the cloud. And this is the area that I'm starting to be concerned about overall for the indexes. If we get continued follow through on the weekly and the daily uh, Russell index, I think this is going to lead us into uh, probably a move down towards the bottom of that box that I was talking about. And the Russell, you know, the IWM may find its way down around this, you know, 135, 130 area down towards the bottom of the channel. We'll have to see if it unfolds that way, but uh, you know the activity was pretty bearish, right? We had a pretty big down week in the Russell, closed on the lows on high volume. Um, you know, there's really nothing good to say about the week or the day uh, in the Russell at this point, and I don't look forward to uh, unless that starts turning around. I don't think we're going to get. A lot of follow through uh, or you know head back to new highs as we were talking about might be a potential uh, last week the diamonds are the uh, the nice index and it also closed in the lows it did not make new highs like the Q's did and the industrial uh, industrials look like you know they're looking fairly weak as well here as you can see we had a pretty bearish reversal week uh, closed on a open on a gap down and we just sold off quite a bit uh, showing some negative momentum we're now below the 50 uh, number on the RSI looking on a um, 10 day or two week look back so that's looking pretty weak <clears throat> the weekly isn't uh, quite as bearish looking although we did close again weekly wise on the low so um, you know, for me, I think looking at the Russell next week and the transports and what's going on uh, news wise is going to probably lead a lot of what's, uh, you know, what, the beginning of the week should show some downside um, momentum to finish off the auction that we have going. We're going to be looking to see if we hit these support levels here or if we start breaking them. If we break them on volume, we're going to see more downside continuation. And, you know, as I've talked about before, the look above and fail activity when you're looking at the uh, volume profile tends to send it towards the other side of the value area. Um, and we could find ourselves, you know, right back down into this zone here again, uh, looking at next week. Okay, another thing I wanted to just briefly talk about um, before I get into the expected move talk uh, I'm going to turn on, I'm going to maximize the daily on the SPY, and I'm going to turn on a couple of other uh, indicators that I've got here. I've got a, a little indicator set that I've made showing the two-year, ten-year spread and the three-month spread. Now this plots on the next day, so I can show you that on the futures of the federal funds rate. Now the website you can look at is treasury.gov. And this, I've looked in the data tab. You go to this tab and you look down in industry, interest rate statistics on that um, sub, uh, sub graph or the uh, sub tab in that area. And you can see the three month 
Treasury bill rate at 2.46% is now above the 10-year, which is 2.44%, which means that you can get a higher interest rate in a shorter time frame than going all the way out to 10-year, and it's above everything in between. And that's usually a sign, or has been a sign in the past, of a uh, recession coming within the next you know, six months to two years time frame. And I'm going to show on the SPY chart here, if I expand out in time and look at, let's see, a 20 year period on the SPY, if I can get it. I'm going to actually go to, I know there's more data the Dow Jones Industrial Average and I'm going to expand the time out to 20 years and let's see if I go back in time you can see the most recent time where the spreads went negative, right? So this plot is the three month compared to the 10 year yield. And this one is the 10 year yield to the two year yield. And these red areas um, are areas that the spreads inverted, meaning that the short term interest rate went above the longer term interest rate. So these red areas are where the yield inverted. And really what I'm showing here is we have recently inverted, and you can see um, this little inversion area here was not met with any significant selling immediately. Uh, and the two-year, 10-year spread, when it inverted uh, in this particular case, and this is going into the big recession we had uh, back in 2006, 7, 8, you know, we had the big sell-off tied to all of the... Uh, financial industry woes with uh, mortgage-backed securities and all those, all that financial crisis that occurred. Um, this inversion did, you know, signal and lead a very significant drop-off of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? So we were up here at the 14,000, we went all the way down to 6,500. But this area here where we're at right now in present time, was not necessarily met with a lot of selling. And I think what we really have to see is probably a little bit more time um, for this uh, inversion area to occur, if history is any foretelling of the future. Um, we, we've got to see a little bit more time of this uh, kind of inverted activity happening in order for us to probably see some significant sell-off. And if I go further back in time, you'll see that there was another period here where the two-year, 10-year spread inverted and then the three-month, 10-year inverted after it. But we did, you know, we were in higher volatility area and we did end up again with, you know, pretty violent uh, shakedowns and sell-offs, right? These are pretty significant drops in, uh, this is around the year 2000. These were significant drops uh, of what happened. This line here is the end of 2000, the end of 2001, and the end of 2002. And you remember back when the internet bubble, you know, burst, we had significant volatility in the market. These are really big swings, you know, from 10,000 down to 8,000, a 2,000 point drop in, you know, roughly two weeks time. Uh, these are significant. But the point is that, you know, these areas lasted for a while. We are going to be in an area where we're going to see a lot of volatility, so I, I would not be surprised if we're going to see some significant whipsawing that's going to go on with this kind of activity that's occurred, right? This is again the three month, 10 year. We had one little blip down and then it pulled back out, you know, and this is just heavy, choppy price activity, a lot of volatility that we're going to see. Um, and you can, you know, kind of look at that and go back farther in time yourself if you want. Now again, this plots, this will plot red on the next day because the data is, is a day behind the way this particular thing plots, the way it plots. So we're going to have a little bit of a red dash here in the three year, 10 year. The two year, 10 year that a lot of people use for the 
worry on inversion is still not going to be read. If I go back to this uh, treasury chart, you see the two-year yield is 2.31 and the 10-year is 2.44. That's about 13 basis points still spread between the twos tens. So it has not inverted and I think that you know, seeing that inverted may be a bit more of a concerning sign. Now, of course, that may happen in the next week if the bond buying continues uh, the way it's been going, and bonds have you know really gone vertical here in the last two or three weeks. Um, you know, we could see some more downside activity, but those are just some things to watch and to be cognizant of. Um, again, you can get the data from the Treasury.gov. You're going to see it all over the news, I'm sure you know, this whole inversion and, and be watching this kind of activity and in particular looking for the twos and the tens to be inverted. Uh, if it happens, I'm sure it's going to be all over the news uh, when and if it happens. So, okay. So let's take a look at ES. I will point one other thing out. We talked last week about the expected move and a little bit of my surprise that the expected move um, you know, was kind of tight compared to the year, uh, the week before. Uh, the expected move we had in the last week, I think, was only about, um, I think, it was 32 points that we talked about. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's not the one I want. This I want last week. 16th. Yeah. So we had 34 points, and you'll see that uh, the ES did come right up to it, and it held in pretty good, and then we sold off, and we didn't you know, eclipse either expected move end, although we ended up closer surprisingly to the downside expected move than the upside expected move. If you look at NQ, again that was a bit of a surprise to me, especially the way the week was going, that we ended up closing within the expected move, especially since it was so much smaller than the week before that eclipsed it. If you look at the NQ, it actually did also poke out above the expected move, which was 124 points and closed well within uh, the week's expected move. And remember these numbers. We had a 34-point uh, for ES, and we had a 174-point. Oh, hold on a minute. Got the wrong one for NQ. NQ did get outside of it on Thursday and pull back within it. Um, so the expected move was 115 points for last week on the NQ. We closed Thursday outside it. We closed within the week's expected move, which is expected. That's what we call the expected move, um, you know, based on the options activity, although the volatility was significantly higher um, than the expected move uh, would have otherwise indicated. And the YM... Okay, I've got the 316 levels in on YM. It was the weaker of the three. Uh, it did get close. We touched it and closed with inside it uh, on the daily chart, and we almost closed on the bottom side expected move. If I look at, and this one here was 300 and something points, if I remember correctly. It's hard to see. It's 371 points. If I get into this week's expected move, uh, which you'll get with the updated levels if you use them, the expected move this week uh, with the volatility that we had, and we're closing the quarter. Uh, why did that not come out? I'll have to fix that. It's my doggy doorbell again. Let's look at NQ. Uh, the expected move for NQ on this week. We have uh, 174 points, so that's quite a bit bigger, right? So we have up or down 174 from the close expected move in the NQ and the ES. Uh, the ES was 34 last week, and it is 
hard to read. It's fifty-two dollars this week, right? So it's expanded out uh, quite a bit, and we're going to have uh, expecting now for the week to have you know not surprisingly with a big uh, you know bullish red candle like we had here that took back all of Thursday plus pretty much the whole week's uh, price activity closing on the low for the week. Uh, we've got a lot of expected uh, volatility for the week and it would not surprise me with a quarterly close that we're going to find our way towards one side or the other and more than likely the way things ended on Friday we're going to find ourselves down in this area here around uh, the bottom end of the expected move is down around 2755. Um, so, you know, 2750 is a big, big number range. And if we get down there, of course, I think it's going to be, you know, pretty bearish looking for the week. Uh, that will, by the way, be towards the bottom of the cloud. And we may get some, you know, penetration. We do have a still a gap to fill here and a gap to fill down here. Uh, and some gaps, you know, right below us here, um, these two blue boxes, you know, that are areas to fill. So I'm not going to be surprised in the least if we have continuation on Monday that gets us down in this range. If we have some positive news, who knows, we may end up finding ourselves on the other side. I think we just got to expect that anything can happen. But at this point, I think we'll call it a wrap for the week, um, you know, looking into some activities. Um, overall, I'm going to be look, looking at the Russell to see what it's doing. If it continues to have some significant downside activity, I think that's going to bode pretty negative, negatively for all the other indexes because, as I said, it tends to lead price activity uh, one way or the other. Okay, that's it for the week. Take care, guys.